Hello, and welcome to episode 31 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on a single topic, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we are going to talk about post-show weight gain. So within this... We'll have some housekeeping first. We will have some housekeeping first. So let's go ahead and get into that housekeeping then. You guys may have seen on... um, Sue's po- or not Sue's podcast, <laughs> Sue's Instagram story that she spoke to us buying our second home. Um, and so we will be moving. Ah. Woof, woof. There's a button on this board that gives claps, but I'm sure that I would pick one that was <laughs> certainly not the claps because I don't know the buttons by heart. Um, but we'll be moving into um, our second home in October in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, We'll be in a suburb of of Dublin, Ohio specifically, but um, we're really excited. Yeah, so some of you guys might have gotten the even earlier inside scoop on Ozzy and Carl's live, but uh, yes, we're moving in October. We are so freaking excited. This has been something that has been in the works for quite some time, so we have been vague about it for sure, but now you know, and so you'll know more and more, not that there's too much more to know, but you'll know more as we get settled and get moved, but we're very excited. Well, I think there is a a good bit for people to know in terms of, um, this is a a big expansion in terms of physique development as a whole. I think that um, one question that we do get quite frequently is that we had the incredible Miguel and and Nick uh, working with us for video content in 20. 20. Um, and Miguel went ahead and took another job that moved him to Austin, Texas. And so we haven't had that same video quality throughout 2021. Our content has lacked because of, of not having those two creative minds being as involved. And so as we make the move, one, we're going to have more space um, to, to make content uh, within the exercise execution work. Um, and then we're going to have more equipment within that gym as well. So we'll we'll still have the home gym. It's going to expand a little bit, which we're, I mean, so excited. So excited. For. Um, this is a, it's a dream come true in terms of having our like own space from a training perspective to the magnitude that we will in this new home um, comparatively to the space that we have now. I love the space that we have now, um, but we a little over double that amount of space in the new home. So very excited for that. And this is just a a stepping stone for uh, Sue and I as we uh, continue to to progress forward towards um, having our own family and those different factors. So this is really important for us to get closer to family and um, just a lot of good stuff. It's a, a move that we're both very excited for, something that we've been um, kind of almost has hindered us throughout this year because yeah. we've been so excited and we've known we were moving since February of this year specifically. Um, and we started looking in September, September of last, of last year. year. <laughs> so it's been a minute. Yeah, it's been quite the process. And so now that it's finally here and, and the, the, you know, the wheels are turning and, and we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's to have this move, um, feels really nice. And, and I'm just excited for this new chapter for us as we close a chapter here in, in Louisville, Kentucky or, or Jeffersonville, Indiana specifically, um, that has been so great to us. And we've met some of our, I mean, truthfully, some of our best friends mm-hmm. at this very moment. And, and, um, yeah, I, I'm it, like, Closing this chapter is is sad for for a handful of reasons, um, but it also just is, uh, I'm very excited for the next one. Yeah, and it's really cool as he talks about the expansion of physique development. It's something that literally started in a college dorm room uh, with just college boys starting something that they were passionate about. And it's grown into something where, I mean, both of those boys have now become men, both have marriages, um, one of them being my own. So that's (laughs) nice. Uh, And us being able to move together in our marriage, move into our first apartment together, buy our first home together, which is a huge milestone and something that will always cherish the, the growth that this house has brought to us. But we are so excited for this 
this next step. I got real teary eyed a few days ago, just thinking about this will be the home that we have our first child in whenever that may be, it will definitely be the home that we have our first child in, which is so exciting to think about. And just something that we will have so much more space to do the things that we need to do for PD. Um, it's something that any of the merch that we've had, anything that we have done as a company has all been out of this home. And that's been something that's been difficult space wise of trying to hold stock and still trying to live our lives while working from home and still trying to have a separation of work life balance and all these other things. And it's just going to be so much more and so much bigger. So within that, um, if you are located in Central Ohio and you are a creative mind, um, it might be something that we might be uh, keeping our eyes out for a few people. So you can definitely shoot an email over to admin at physiquedevelopment.com. If you feel inclined, we'd love to know your story or why you feel like you would fit um, or fill a hole within physique development on that creative side. And we'll, of course, take a look at those and see what direction we want to go. Yeah. And I think that that kind of wraps up us us moving um literal housekeeping yeah housekeeping <laughs> uh and then we'll we'll dig into the the topic of of post contest for you guys to give you a little bit of insight in terms of um how we go about things with our clients some of the recommendations that we have for you and and sue will have a handful of the questions or more so topics that we're going to cover within that yeah. So it is something where I would recommend if you are interested in learning about a full improvement season, it's mine specifically, but we also touch on a lot of things as far as an improvement season in general. If you listen to this episode and maybe want to learn a little bit more, there is a whole podcast on my improvement season with Alex and I. And if you didn't know, now you know, Alex is my coach. So it's pretty easy to go through the whole gauntlet of things when we are together 24 um, seven. But getting into some different questions here about post show weight gain. So and before we get into the questions, for those who are not um, familiar with contest prep, potentially, and you've gotten to this point in the podcast, I think it would be advantageous for us to give you a little bit of groundwork so that you're not like, why is this such a difficult process potentially for people? Um, when we're looking at a contest prep, this is going to be an extended period of time in a, in a steep caloric deficit, uh, which is going to get individuals to a very excessively low level of body fat that's not normal to get to. Um, and so the, the process is very strenuous on the body as well as the mind. And so the process of coming out of that dieting phase, looking that way for extended periods of time, seeing the scale in a facet of like, it needs to go down on a very regular basis, to now shifting gears to the the opposite more so is a very challenging time for a lot of athletes. And so if you're not familiar with competing, that gives you a little bit of the the framework, I suppose, to kind of the, the questions and topics that we're going to dig into today. Yeah. And I would say on the mental side, just to add into that, especially with females who majority of our clients are females. So this is speaking directly to you all. Um, it's something throughout competing as you are trying to get to that extreme level of leanness. It's also not sustainable, but we have grown up in a society that has really favored very small women or women taking up less space. So I feel like it adds an extra layer of difficultness um, or difficulties <laughs> more so difficultness. Um, difficultness, difficulty as you have been told your whole life to be smaller, 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 to take up less space. You find competing, you feel powerful within your musculature, but any competitor who's close to a show day, if they're wearing like just a t-shirt, like a normal t-shirt, not a fitted one or a sweatshirt, you can look extremely small. Um, and it's something where of course your muscles give you power and strength and you feel fulfilled within that, but it's still chasing after being the smallest and leanest version of yourself. And if you've been told that your whole life, you go through a competition and then you go into intentional weight gain, that can be really, really, really mentally difficult to deal with. So locking down where your mentality is at during prep, of course, but also post-show is going to be so astronomically important. I cannot express that enough. If you don't do the mental work before, it will present physically in a way that you probably will not like post-show um, if you're not doing that mental work. So, Alex, what do you do if you have immediate gain or if you gain too much post-show? So, within more immediate gain, how this is going to transpire is that the individual is going to obviously overconsume to a upteenth degree um, over an, an extended period of time. 
Now, within this, I think that ways to mitigate this prior to it transpiring, and do we get into that later? A little bit as far as just having a plan before okay. um, your show day. Okay. And so I, I think that let's say that we do have that immediate gain, and we'll speak on kind of how to avoid that later on. But if we have that immediate gain, the unfortunate aspect of this is that it's not its not kind of like an, an eraser. We, we can't erase the body fat that has been accumulated now. When we understand um, how fat cells uh, transpire, when we have, like you're always going to have a, a level of, of fat cells, no matter how lean that you become, they're just depleted. And so the crummy part of, of having this rapid weight gain or, or fat gain more so is that we're creating more fat cells. So now we're like, damn, now we have more of the thing that we didn't inherently want. And now we have more that fill up. And so what the, the issue becomes is that we have this greater quantity of body fat. Thus, we have to just try to, to weather the storm more so and mitigate the amount of body fat that has been accumulated. You can't get back into a dieting phase. I mean, you can, I mean, it's your life, it's your body, you do what you want to do. But getting back into a dieting phase is going to be very strenuous and, and probably very unsuccessful, especially in the place from a hormonal perspective that you're in from a thyroid function standpoint, as well as sexual um, or sex hormone production and those different factors. Um, so at that point, the goal is to get right back on track where your food was supposed to be staying consistent with your cardio. It's not a time to, to try and, and correct. It's not a time to get in and try to do two hours of cardio on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and try to erase, like I said, what had transpired. So the big thing is just getting back on, uh, staying very consistent within your water consumption, staying very consistent within your micronutrient consumption, consumption, training hard, getting your cardio in those different factors are, are going to apply. Um, and also being kind to yourself. I think that that's another big piece of the puzzle from a mental aspect is that uh, the individual needs to understand that they've made a mistake, but it's not this time to like really beat up on yourself and, and you know tell yourself that you're a piece of shit and all this stuff. Like it's not worth that. It's just a matter of, okay, this is behind us. How can we move into um, doing things the correct way and getting yourself into the best health that you possibly can be in? Yeah. And it's also something with them talking about fat cells is that you don't ever really lose fat cells. So you can lose fat. So you kind of think of your fat cells like a balloon. Um, and it's something that as you lose fat, your fat cells become a deflated balloon and they're just chilling in your body just not disturbing anyone. But as you gain fat back, those balloons get refilled. Um, and then it's something that if those balloons get filled to the brink, they're like, I can't fill up anymore, then new fat cells are accumulate, accumulated. Um, so it is something as far as that post-show that it is very easy to just be like, well, I don't have a show date. I don't have a goal right now. And I'm not going to be in a bikini on stage in front of everyone or small swim trunks or whatever it may be, like it doesn't matter as much. But outside of the aesthetic side of things, it is something that your hormonal health and your health as a whole matters. And you don't want to put yourself in a worse position than you need to within doing something extreme. When you do anything extreme, you have to be aware that there's going to be extreme circumstances if you don't try to make sure that that extreme doesn't get into a worse extreme. Um, so within that, some Something that's very helpful for our clients is telling them like, hey, just think that you're still in prep for the next six or eight weeks. Like assume that mentality to a certain degree to really make sure you're setting yourself up for success. If you get to that six or eight weeks and you've really shown up for yourself after you've just put in so much work, it, it's, it's something that instead of just being like, I've put in the work, I'm all done thinking I've put in the work now to continue to progress. I need to put in the work for six to eight more weeks to make sure my body's not in a vulnerable vulnerable spot. Um, so if you can really show up for yourself for six to eight more weeks, you can put yourself way ahead of the game than if you get kind of lost in those first one to two weeks post-show. So going into um, what that looks like for your rate of gain, I know that's a common question of how much weight um, should you gain or what rate should you gain weight? So within the rate of gain, I think that one thing that I personally do, and I know that um, our, our coaches who are working with contest prep clients are going to to follow this suit as well, is that um, 
I'm not so concerned with with scale readings from a week to week perspective of us trying to gain a specific number back on the scale. And you, you could have a varying view on this, but um, I'm more so going to be focusing on the amount of caloric density that I'm adding from a week to week or a, a biweekly perspective. And then I'm going to be paying very close attention to overall biofeedback markers as well as training performance rather than the scale readings that are at play. Um, and then paying very close attention to visual photos because those are going to be much more important to me as a whole um, than the, the scale readings. Because I, I think that if you focus too heavily on the scale, what's going to transpire, uh, especially for the the athlete, is that um, any small shift and and you put these markers in place and, and this individual is, is very honed in, if they go above that, where it could simply be that they ate too late or they had a hard leg session and they're having some fluid retention from the night before or something, um, it becomes a little bit of a, of a obsessive behavior if they're not uh, overly understanding that it's just a data point and like we spoke to, the mental aspect post-show is is a very vulnerable place to be. And so honing in on the other aspects that I speak to or I spoke to uh, is going to be more advantageous, at least in, in my personal experience. So what I will do is that um, post-show, we will increase 100 to 300 calories from a day-to-day -day perspective into their intake. Uh, it could be a little bit higher than that. It just depends on the individual and kind of where their, their headspace is at. Um, and then how responsive their body is and all of that, how the end of their prep went. Right. Um, and then cardio is going to be uh, adjusted as well. This is a, a big piece that I think that many individuals kind of get lost in is that the, the cardio aspect, they just want to drop it immediately. You can uh, bring out a good bit of the cardio to begin with, I would say maybe 20 to 30% of the total minutes of cardio potentially being titrated down. I like to move into a total step count that's going to be relative to potentially the uh, amount of cardio that they were doing over the, the time period, if that's possible, just to get them outside and to get them off the treadmill because they've just spent, you know, maybe 16 to 20 plus weeks um, busting their ass on that treadmill or the Stairmaster or whatever piece of, of cardio equipment that they're utilizing, um, just to give them a little bit of a change of scenery as well as change of pace and those different factors. So weight, uh, the, the rate of weight gain is not a marker that I use so inherently, um, but more so the biofeedback. And uh, specifically, I think that sleep, energy, um, skin health, there's a lot of different things that we're focusing on rather than the, the scale itself. Yeah. And I, I completely agree. It's something that if you just make it all about the it, the data is the numbers, of course, but if you make it just about scale weight, and especially because scale weight is something that people have a very strong connection to. Um, when we look at the other data markers, someone might not have as strong of a connection to it. But when it comes to scale weight, I mean, most of us have gotten on a scale from a very young age. Uh, the doctor weighs us, we're aware of what our weight is generally. And so it's something that especially within a prep where you're constantly stepping on the scale every day, Day, and you're seeing that number go down and down and down, if you start seeing that number vary, then it gets in your head. So one thing to keep in mind, if you do put in a specific um, rate of gain that you want someone to have is one, make sure it's an average of weight gain, not be like, we want one pound per month. And then if they gain two pounds one month, and then half a pound the next that you're like, you sucked this month, like make it an average. But it's also something where when someone's in prep, they are extremely regimented. So their scale weight is going to be pretty linear. It's not going to be completely linear, but it's going to be a lot more linear than any other time. Um, when they go into an improvement season, there's going to be variables just inherently. Even if someone is hitting their macros and doing their cardio and hitting their training sessions, they might be a little bit more flexible on when their last meal is or um, if they're going out to eat and still tracking it. There's going to be more variables in place. And so someone's weight is going to vary a little bit more. And then especially 
especially if you're dealing with females, trying to get hormonal health back in place, trying to get cycles back, um, and the female body is just very complex in general, you're going to see that weight vary. And it's also going to depend on if someone was fully filled out for a show and they saw what that number was on the scale and what that looks like, um, if they are going to be depleted after that and how that raises and, and falls. So I don't think that just looking and being like, this is what we're going to gain and we're going to stick directly to this because you want to be able to be flexible in your approach, even if you have the same end goal. Um, because if you just shut someone in to a certain thing that they have to do, um, and you're not paying attention to outside factors, then you can really just screw the pooch on that. Um, you can end up putting someone's mentality in a weird headspace. Um, you can end up them not seeing as many results as they could have because you were so focused on that one number. Where for me personally, my weight has fluctuated throughout my improvement season of maybe we uh, scale ticks up a little bit. And then depending on how we change things, maybe it ticks back down. But on average, we kind of have a idea of where things are at. But at the beginning of the improvement season, we didn't know for sure exactly how much weight we needed to gain. We knew generally how much weight, but if he just put a specific number on it, then I might be very much so in my head of if I see that number go up, then I can't do X, Y, and Z, or it might be harder for me to follow the plan. So um, I don't think that having that specific number is helpful. I think it's helpful to focus on the things that Alex talked about as far as the biofeedback markers, skin health, hormonal health, um, and being able to see performance in the gym pickup and a lot of other aspects that you can look at outside of weight. Yeah. And I think that maybe something that will click with everyone is that it's significantly easier to attain a number on the scale, uh, whatever that would be in terms of going vertically um, and just you know, adding an excessive amount of calories. And it's like maybe, you know, Sue pushes up to 100. If we would have put a cap on it and said 140 pounds, we could have pushed there pretty yeah. quickly. Um, and we would have not been happy with the look. So understand that the, the goal of having a specific look and seeing the improvements from a musculature perspective and, and paying attention to photos is going to be your driver rather than this arbitrary number on the scale that's constantly fluctuating. Um, and that's been kind of how we've, I mean, that's how I drive every single one of the improvement seasons, but specifically Sue's here, um, is, is how we've gone about things. And I think that's a big part of where, why her mental health has been so good throughout this improvement season but also why we've had such good success because we're paying attention to the things that actually matter. Um, because when you get on that stage, there's never going to be a time that anyone asks you outside of maybe some of the girls backstage, um, ask you what your weight is and, and your weight is not going to be judged, um, at all, uh, from a judging perspective. So what's going to be judged is the look. So pay attention there. And, and obviously with like men's open bodybuilding and classic physique, there's going to be weight limits and those different factors. But speaking to what our main demographic is going to be within uh, bikini and, and wellness and figure more. So those individuals are not going to be asked what their weight is. Yeah. No one needs to know your weight on stage. The judges don't know nothing. So that doesn't matter. And it also helped not to have a looming number over my head. Um, whether that be something of that I was scared that I was going to hit it too quickly. Or if he said a bigger number that I was like, man, I really don't want to see myself at that weight because I'm picturing myself what I've been at that weight in the past instead of looking forward and just looking at these other metrics as I move forward. I'm not just focused on that one thing. So within that, how long should an improvement season be? The improvement season should be as long as it takes you to have the improvements that you need to make, um, as well as restoration of uh, your hormonal health, um, making sure that you're in a place to where uh, you've actually made strides, like I said, within your physique. I think that too many people find that uh, they compete and then they're like, I need a break. And then they start to see on Instagram uh, shows are kicking back up because shows are going to go from March until December. And so you've really got two months where you, you may not see content from active shows. And in that time frame, people are still throwing up post of, of their you know, time on stage. And so I think that people get kind of caught up in the loop of like, well, I got to compete every single year so that I stay you know, relevant from potentially an Instagram perspective or what have you. Um, and so I think that the improvement season needs to be as, as long as, um, uh, 
is necessary and and kind of a a spinoff of this question potentially being how long should the reverse period be before you were to get into a place of maintenance or surplus um, is that I would say between 10 and 16 weeks is kind of a good threshold. 16 is going to be the slower approach as a whole. Some of the individuals who are just maybe struggling a little bit more from a, a, a mental health perspective to to find their groove, I go a little bit slower with. And a lot of it's going to come down to communication and those different factors as a, a whole as well. Yeah, and I've made the mistake in the past of my past improvement season. So I've competed for three seasons. Um, this is my third um full improvement season. Each improvement season was a year to a year and a half, which is a good time frame. Um, it is a, it's not a three month turnaround that I'm getting back on stage where in three months I still have to reverse. So I've basically not spent any time in maintenance and I'm back in a prep. It wasn't anything like that, but I just had the attitude of, Oh, I know that my improvement season should be longer than that. So I just went off of, Oh, it's been about a year. It's been about a year and a half. This is the first improvement season. I was talking to Alex about this the other day, that I've truly not been focused on, oh, it's been a year, it's been a year and a half. I've just been focused on, do I truly think that I've made improvements that I need to go up there to do what I said I was going to do? Because I can tell you that nothing sucks more than getting up there when you're not ready after you've spent time really working to be ready and realize that you cut yourself short. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of everything. It's a lot of stress. And it it just, it fucking sucks. And so it's something that instead of getting wrapped up and I have to compete, I have to stay relevant, or I, I really love competing, so I have to be on stage all of the time. If you love competing and you love the sport, then you have to get yourself in the mindset of improving. This is a sport of bodybuilding, even if it's a bikini athlete all the way up to open bodybuilders. Your goal is to improve the way your body looks, not just continue to be lean for Instagram photos or to feel good about yourself. So being able to truly look and say, hey, I wanted to see these improvements. Did I actually see those improvements or am I just tired of working towards those or I want to get back on stage? Um, it's going to be extremely important questions um, and really hard questions to ask yourself. And I think something to branch off of that as well is that if you are just like you go from the stage and then you don't put effort forth in terms of really wanting to improve, you're still going to the gym, but you're not really tracking your food. You're kind of haphazardly training. Some weeks you're getting three sessions in, some weeks you're getting five. They're not, there's not really a training program in, in place. This is not an improvement season. This is just a break. This is just a break. So let's say that you haven't got on stage in a year, but you've done that kind of wishy-washy BS that you want to call an improvement season you've got to go, okay, now I'm from this point, I'm actually going to take a true improvement season, take this serious. I'm going to take another year. And then I'm going to analyze, am I even ready to get back on stage? Or do I need even more time because I've, I've taken the last year and just kind of haphazardly gone through the motions because you're going to be like, you're going to be really upset if you went from a season and then you just haphazardly did things, got back up on stage, looked exactly the same. And you're like, I took a year off season. It's like, no, you didn't. No, no, you didn't. You, you took a full year off. You, you were correct. But you, you didn't take an improvement to that season of your time. So be honest with yourself on that front as well of, of how direct you're being uh, within that improvement season uh, when you're going into that next prep. And no, it's okay to have a break. Yeah, of course. If you don't want it to be a full-on improvement season, but don't call it an improvement season, get up there again and then be disappointed with your results. If you need a break from competing and the hustle and bustle of all of it, we all get it. Anyone who's a competitor gets it as far as needing a mental break from being in the machine constantly. That is okay to do. But make sure at the end of it, if you're getting back up there, that you've truly done something to improve upon yourself or to a certain degree, you're making a mockery of the sport and making it not about improvement. You're making it about you wanting to get up there. Um, so it is something of truly being able to take your time into consideration, your coach's time into consideration, your loved one's time into consideration. Because going through a prep, regardless of how supportive someone is, it is a 
a strain on relationships. And so it is something that if you compete and you haven't improved, it's honestly a little bit disrespectful to everyone in your life that you're putting them through that when you haven't done anything different. Hot take. Uh, so, um, how do you, what do you need to do post prep as far as switching your mentality or what tips would you give? Um, in terms of shifting mentality, I think that having the, the plan in place, you know, post show with your coach and speaking with them, uh, very intentionally of what you, where your head is at, what your intentions are for the improvement season is going to, to help a ton here. Because I think that oftentimes the mentality portion becomes very difficult if you're misaligned with the individual who's putting the plan into place. And so being very vocal with them and very honest with where you stand is going to help a ton for you and the coach. Um, so that's part of it. But I think that also shifting your mentality away from the scale or away from, um, potentially constant pictures and those different factors and shifting it towards training performance, I think is going to be a big piece of the puzzle. Um, how much can you, or how quickly can you get your hormonal function back into order? I think that shifting that and, and getting your goals in alignment with what's there is very important because Sue had alluded to earlier speaking to of like, well, I don't have a show. I don't really have anything tangible to speak to of what my goal is. So the, the, you know, the day after your show, potentially you have an intuitive day after the show and you get to enjoy the city that you're in, what have you that Monday now that goal starts of, of how can I improve my overall training performance? What do I need to work on? What muscle groups do I need to see improvements in? How can I improve that? How can I get my hormonal function into the best place possible? How can I take care of my internal health optimally throughout this entire uh, improvement season through the reverse diet itself? So I think that having those concrete goals is going to be painfully important for your overall mentality or you're going to be in this kind of lost zone of things where you're going to have good days and you're going to have really crappy days. And it's going to be this kind of just constant peaks and valleys um, until you find that direction that needs to transpire. Yeah. And when you're setting these goals, instead of just setting a vague goal of I want to improve or I want to be better in the gym, make them smart. Like the, the concept of smart goals is very intelligent. That's why they're smart goals. But you want it to be specific. You want it to be measurable. You want it to be attainable. You want it to be realistic. Um, and you want it to be timely. If you just say, I want to improve in the gym, that's not specific. What is improvement in the gym? How can you measure that? So instead, okay, I want to be able to lift this much for this specific lift, or I want to be able to do this lift for this many reps at this weight, or my goal is to get to um, being able to have my resting heart rate at this, whatever it may be, having very specific goals, because otherwise you can get lost in a muddled feeling of what am I really doing here? Am I progressing? Because the goals you've set are very, I mean, just vague. And they they don't allow you to really have something to forge towards because you can change what your perception is of getting better in the gym. Um, you can always change that. But if you're specific about your goals, then you can't necessarily change that. You know what you have set up to do and you know what that looks like. So really making sure that you're focusing on those things that Alex talked about, as well as even focusing on, again, the people in your life and what that looks like. Um, because when it comes to competing, as much as of it is very selfish and you showing up for you day in and day out, at the end of the day, it's something that that mentality that we've talked about, if you don't nurture things outside of competing, then competing can be even harder. So you need to make sure that you have support, that you have loved ones, that you're supporting other people. Um, and that's something that goes into that mentality that I feel like a lot of people don't talk about because you can feel extremely unfulfilled if you go season to season and don't do anything else in between. Um, so it's something as much as your focus might be day in and day out on competing, you also have to look at what that wear and tear is going to be on your mentality and what you need to show up or who you need to show up within that. I think that that lends to something that Sue and I speak to a lot is the that balance is ever changing. And so your balance within prep is going to be vastly different than what your balance looks like um, 
you know, post post show or what have you is that uh, getting in contest ready shape is very extreme. And so you're going like with having an extreme goal, you're going to have kind of a, an obsessed priority list where this this one thing getting ready for this show or getting ready for multiple shows is going to have a much higher priority than probably what most would say is like, that's yeah, that may not be a good idea. But the, the reality is that for the athletes who are wanting to excel and be at a very high level, that's what's necessary to transpire for them to get to that point. Um, and so understanding that and understanding that it's okay for those priorities to to work on kind of a, a, a shifting list, because that's how life works, you're going to have to have different priorities at different times of your life um, is okay. And, and coming to terms with that is very important for the athletes as well. 100%. Um, so we've kind of already touched on this, but it is extremely important to have a plan before post-show starts. So whether that is something that you know your coach already has it covered and you're going to talk about it the day after your show, that's okay. You don't need to ask your coach, hey, I need to know the exact game plan for the next six months post-show, but more so just making sure it's part of the conversation. So I know some um, prep coaches that you only hire them for the prep. And so making sure you're aware of that, if it is something where you have have already dedicated. Some people also don't think about, okay, I need to keep my coach post show. I would highly encourage that to be able to have someone you need someone objective. It's a very vulnerable time. It's a very malleable time for your body. And so I would highly suggest you budget to again, have a coach post show. And if you plan on competing for multiple seasons, having them throughout the improvement season, but that's things that some people don't think about. So think about what's happening post show and think about what activities you have post show. If you're immediately going on vacation post show where you're not going to be tracking, you're not going to be training for some people, people that might be completely fine for others that might not be completely fine. So being able to have those conversations with your coach about, hey, this is what I have going on LifeWise post-show. These are different things I want to like be able to talk about um, and make sure you have a plan with your coach. Like, hey, we're going to touch base on this day and here's your plan until then um, and what that looks like. Because otherwise, you're just so focused on your show as you should be that then the day after your show, you're like, well, what now? So making sure you have that plan before your show day is going to be extremely, extremely beneficial for you to be successful as you continue to move forward. Yeah, I think that um, within the component in which the um, the individual taking a vacation post show, I would reserve that for individuals who have gone through multiple reverses or improvement seasons that have been seasoned competitors. I think that that would probably be okay because you have an understanding of kind of where your your hunger signaling is probably going to be and then those different things. For a first-time competitor, I would highly advise against going on that vacation right after the show, four weeks post show, potentially. Um, but I would say the week following a, a show, that's just a recipe for very high challenge, potential disaster solely because this is going to be the highest hunger that you've experienced probably in your, in your life that you can remember solely because the, the boundaries are now you blurred. Know, blurred for sure but also like the there's no tangible goal that's right there in front of you of like i have a show in a week or i have a show in two weeks where you may be experiencing similar hunger but the goal is so close that you can kind of mitigate that from a mentality perspective um so being mindful of that the component in which sue spoke to about the uh, not prioritizing the uh, coach following the show. And so this is one of the things that is is one of the largest irritants for me as a coach uh, because it puts me in a very compromised position where at that time I'm it, it, extremely focused on that individual's health. And now I'm in this compromised position of I, I, I can't work for free but I also care so much for this individual that I want to help. And so it's a really hard place for me personally to be in for Sue as well in this scenario. It it just puts the coach in a very compromised position. It makes me very, very frustrated and, um, I don't even know the right word. It, it, it's just, I, I hate that situation. It, it's, I, I don't like using the word hate, but that is a situation that I, I truthfully despise because 
it feels like such a lose lose, no matter what choice that I make, um, of like just helping the individual because it means that much to me. And then I'm working for free and it's, it's like, I've got this number of clients who, who pay top dollar to have my service. And I'm just doing this out of the, the kindness of my heart more so. And so it's just a crummy situation on both sides. So please, 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 especially if you have a coach who is painfully invested like myself, um, <laughs> <laughs> prioritize that. Yeah. And it's also something where, I mean, not that you should make all of your decisions based on this, but this is our livelihood as coaches and our work is reflected directly on you guys. And so if it's something that directly post-show, you decide it's not important and you go off and do whatever, it puts us in a spot where our work is reflected in that. And then there might be things that kind of fly around um, about like, well, they don't care about people post-show or this person did X, Y, and Z. It's something that at the end of the day, like we care so freaking deeply about each of our clients and it does put us in an extremely compromised position. And I have worked for free to make sure someone's health is in the best spot, but it's not the ideal situation to put anyone in, the competitor or the coach. And so it's something of truly looking and making sure that if you're committing to a prep, know that it is very financially draining on top of also being mentally hard, physically hard, and a whole other slew of things. It's a wonder why we do it. We love it. Um, but it is something that if you aren't budgeting for a coach post-show and you're not budgeting for your health post-show, then that's something to reflect of, are you actually ready to compete? If you are in a place where you're going um, and you can't pay for things that are going to be important within competing, like take that into consideration. And this isn't me coming from a place of saying like, everyone needs to have unlimited limited funds ready for a show. But if you know, hey, a show is going to cost anywhere from or like a prep is going to cost like two to five thousand dollars make sure you have that money put aside um, and make sure that you even have a conversation with the coach that you're hiring as far as what's going to be expected of you finance wise um, so that you have the clearest picture because it's extremely hard when someone gets to the end of the prep or t like gets near the end of the prep or to the end of the prep. And it's a financial reason because again, it's putting everyone in a very hard spot to be. Um, and it's something that we want people to be successful post-show. Um, and so we want to make sure that that is clear and facilitated um, as we move forward. And on that financial note, I have an example of a, a client who I won't share her name because uh, I, I haven't ran this story across her yet. <laughs> um, but within that, she was she's one of the hardest working individuals I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, and what she she would she would have her job in the morning, um, and then she would go to school during the day, and then train in the afternoon, get her cardio done, and then she to be able to have the finances for the uh, the bikini for the show for anything that was extra, she was picking up shipped orders, which I thought was a, a fantastic idea of just being able to get a little bit of extra cash whenever she had the possibility of it. Um, and so she was doing the shipped orders in the evening. So it's, it's a matter of it coming down to what's, you know, important to you on that front. How much time are you willing to allocate and, and, and make it work? Because as a, she's that, that individual is a college student who, um, gosh, I, most organized person I've ever met as mm -hmm. well. As you can imagine with having that kind of schedule, you have to be organized to get anything done. Um, but I think that prioritizing things and just getting creative, especially as, as college students, as you may be someone who's just freshly out of college, getting into the workforce or, or finding yourself as a college student wanting to compete, wanting to work with coaches who are going to have a, a greater concern with your health because that is one thing within college students is that... Um, they, they find themselves in this situation where they don't have the funds to to work with a, a coach who's really going to be hands-on with them and go the cheaper route and then find themselves in this position where um, they're getting a check-in every other week and not having protocols taken into consideration. They're getting into poor hormonal health and then finding themselves post-show without any direction. And they're like, well, you know, competing did this to me. And the reality is, is that competing didn't do this to you. Really poor guidance did this to you more so. And so I think that understanding that and, and understanding that going into your show of just wait another year, 
do an entire year of, of randomly picking up shipped orders when you have some spare time in the evening and then being able to go with the coach that you know is going to take great care of you throughout that prep and also have you competing well on that stage and just wait that extra year because the stage is still going to be there. And I think you'll be painfully more happy with it as well as have such a better experience and be able to speak to bodybuilding in a positive light rather than it being like bodybuilding ruined my hormones. It ruined X, Y, and Z, my mental health, all these things. And it it very well can with poor guidance as I'm speaking to. And now from a word from our sponsors, Shipt is a great, (laughs) Um, we do use Shipt, but they're not our sponsor, but it is something, and I cannot reiterate enough. This is not um, either of us coming from a spot of saying like, you just need more money to be able to be successful. Zero percent, like what we're trying to say or facilitate across this. The first time both of us competed, we had nothing. We did not have money to put towards it. I was a very broke college student. And I actually had worked for the state when I was in high school. And so I got like a retirement bonus from them. Um, And then I was at school all day long and training early in the morning, and then going to work in the evening, my schedule was insane. And I know Alex's was the exact same way. So it's not us saying like, hey, until you're making that coin, that big coin, you shouldn't even touch your toes in this. This is only for the elite of the elite because we sure as hell were broke ass college students getting on that stage. And we cut corners where it made sense, but we didn't cut corners where we knew that we needed to pay it forward for our health, for our results, for everything to be where it needed to be. So again, not trying to say it's just for a certain price bracket, but just being aware that there is a price tag on competing. So, and the time will only benefit you within a show. So if you do wait and save up, you're only going to look better. So that's always something to look forward to. Uh, The last two things that we have here is just talking about a hormonal shift post-show as well as your hunger post-show and what that looks like. So within hunger post-show, really the main thing I wanted to touch on is I know I hear within verses of, oh, I'm hungry or should I honor my hunger? Um, And it's something that throughout prep, you were hungry too. Did you honor your hunger there? And again, taking that mentality of, hey, I'm in prep for another eight weeks post-show and having that mentality taking forward. There are going to be days Days where your hunger is high, but Alex has already mentioned it in a few different regards, but this is another one. Talk to your coach. If it's coming to a point of being unbearable, where you're in a really negative headspace, where you're having the propensity to go towards something like purposely overeating or getting into a binge or anything like that, have a conversation. But at the end of the day, you probably are going to be hungry post-show. But again, you have to take that mentality of what that looks like for during your prep as well. Yeah, I, I think that the hormonal fluctuations and hunger signaling from a, a hormone perspective could be its own separate podcast and would be very in-depth for us to kind of finish this already, what I would say is lengthier yeah. podcast as a whole. Um, but understand that you're going to have hormonal downregulation across the board. Of course, as you're losing the amount of body fat that you do, you may lose your menstrual cycle during the, the prep itself. So the restoration of that is going to transpire through the reverse diet, which is a big piece of the puzzle of why you need to stay on target with your, with your food, um, you know, manage your, your stress and, and prioritize your sleep and these different factors, just as you would have been doing throughout the the prep itself, but just the the timeline has has now changed, and so uh, that's going to be the the aspects that transpire from a hormonal perspective. Thyroid function is going to downregulate as well, so you're wanting to upregulate that, of course, um, as well as getting your hunger signaling into a better position because the hunger signaling is going to naturally be a little bit more excessive as a whole. And even let let's say that you're not prioritizing your sleep, now this is going to even exacerbate. I always say that word weirdly. I never say it right. Um, It's going to exacerbate that component as well. So when we don't have, when we're sleeping, we're going to um, produce the hunger signal or hunger hormone that is going to uh, tell us that we're more satiated. Thus, if you're not having quality sleep, you're going to not have that secretion of that specific hormone. Thus, you're going to be hungrier throughout the day um, and, and feel like you need to honor this kind of 
folks hunger, if you will, because of the mitigation of the hormone signaling. Thus, um, it's not, it's going to push you into a place of, of greater fat gain in those different aspects, potentially if you're over consuming those different factors. So, yeah. um, and like you said, it could be a whole nother podcast, but the only thing I do want to mention is even if you have no intention of ever competing again, even if you don't have a plan and a whole improvement season, it still matters that next eight weeks for your hormonal health in general. So please, 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 if you could take anything from this, just focusing on your health at the end of it, I'm not talking about aesthetics or weight gain or anything like that, just focus on your health those first eight weeks post-show and so much benefit will come from it. Correct. And individuals who are utilizing PEDs, this is going to be another, so important. this is another, yeah, like yeah. I said, another podcast, blood panels. What I would say within that, um, from a hormone perspective, PEDs or no PEDs is going to be half the time that you were in prep. So if you were in prep for 20 weeks, I would say getting your first set of panels, a full panel ran within your, uh, sex hormone panel, as well as your thyroid panel. And then your just basic blood markers. I would say 10 weeks. And then if your prep was you know, 24 weeks, then at 12 and so on and so forth. Now, for the individuals who did the crazy preps through COVID, um, <laughs> that's a little bit of a, of a different scenario because the prep ended up being you know, ex like long. excessively long because of the scenarios. <laughs> um, but that's another aspect to things is that if you, if you went the route of utilizing PEDs, now we've got to get you, it's even of greater... Um, what's the word urgency, uh, to, to get you into a better understand or better place from a hormonal perspective, as well as overall lipid profiles and, and other facets. So. And if you make the decision to use PEDs and you don't give a fuck about what happens post-show, then maybe you should reflect and see if that should be something that you utilize in general, um, because it really matters post-show. Um, yeah, so don't get labs directly post-show. Things are going to be way off. Just give your body some time, get some good sleep, really re-regulate things, and then get them in that time frame that Alex talked about and really being able to take a deeper dive into that. So... Hope you guys learned something. If you have further questions, as always, we'll have a Google form in the show notes um, for you guys to be able to either enter your follow-up questions or if there's a topic that you want us to fully go over. We often pull questions from our Q&A boxes on Instagram, so you can always make sure you follow us. Alex and I, who are on today's podcast, and then Austin, the other co-owner, all of our names are in the show notes as well as the Physique Development Instagram, um, and you can always see things there but that's what we got for you but keep an eye out or an ear out more so for some new podcasts coming in december with the new coaches that we'll be announcing here soon peace and guys. blessings